The black spider monkey is one of the most charming of the many animals that make their home in the great Amazonian forests of South America. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. How many acres of undisturbed forest in the Amazon do you think would be needed to support a small group of monkeys? 50 acres, 100? After all, these monkeys in captivity and well provided with food get along fine in their man-made environment that can be measured in feet, not acres. Well, the present estimate is that in the wild, the black spider monkey alone, which on average lives in small groups of two to eight, would need about 500 acres of rainforest to survive on a diet of mostly fruit and some insects. 500 acres is a lot of land, but each year we're losing about 30 million acres of rainforest as the trees are sacrificed to make room for farms and cattle ranches. In short, in a generation or two, these little South American primates may have no place to live but here, captives in zoos and animal parks. This is the kind of thing we're learning from a remarkable study being conducted by my friend, the founding science advisor of the Nature Series, Dr. Tom Lovejoy of the World Wildlife Fund. The Amazon rainforest stretches to the farthest horizon like a vast green ocean. And like an ocean, its deceptively simple facade conceals a complex world just beneath the surface. The humid interior of this three million square mile forest houses a diversity of flora and fauna unmatched on our planet. There are thousands of tree species, and rainforests contain more than one half of all the animal species existing in the world. From the powerful jaguar at the top of the food chain. To the smallest insects. Animal species in Amazonia may number literally in the millions each species is specially adapted for its niche in the most intricately woven ecological tapestry known. At first glance, the forest can seem peaceful, but all those millions of creatures are struggling to survive, some succeeding, some failing. In a sense, this immense biomass sprawling over the huge Amazon River basin can be thought of as a single superorganism, where each species has a role to play in maintaining the system as a whole. The lifeblood of this superorganism falls from the sky 
At any one time, an average of 240 billion tons of water are suspended above the Amazon basin. That translates into 10 feet of rain per year. One sixth of all the world's river water flows through the Amazon River. But only a fourth of the rain that falls here is actually carried away to the sea. The rest returns to the air via evaporation and tree transpiration to be recycled as rain, nearly making the Amazon a closed system. The torrents of water dissolve nutrients present on the leaves and wash them to the ground, helping replenish the poor soil of the rainforest. With that much water pouring over the forest floor, it's no surprise that many of the ground-dwelling species are aquatic. Frogs, turtles, and other cold-blooded animals thrive in the wet depths of Amazonia. Thirty-foot anacondas lurk in the warm water. While above, a perfectly camouflaged emerald tree boa awaits unwary prey. Indians appeared at least 10,000 years ago and were the first colonists in the rainforest. With primitive but effective tools, the Indians took sustenance from the forest without degrading it significantly. The unvarying warm climate and the presence of abundant fruits and animals provided a good home for millennia, and the Indian tribes thrived, living in relative harmony with the forest. Each tribe developed its own special customs, traditions, and ceremonies. But times have changed. To a great extent, this is today's Amazon. The people now dance to a different drum. In the last 100 years, modern man has poured into the rainforest with a flood of machines and noise, creating cities like Manaus, Brazil. The city of Manaus, with a population of one million, sits at the confluence of the Amazon and Rio Negro rivers. The Amazon's brown water carries sediments washed down off the high Andes. The Rio Negro, a flatland river, acquires its black color from decaying organic matter. The waters of the two rivers flow in a common channel for miles before finally mixing. In the late 1800s, with the explosion of the rubber trade, Manaus became a major cultural center of South America, even boasting an opera house, the Teatro Amazonas, which brought European culture to the rubber barons. The rubber trade brought the first major exploitation of Amazonian resources. Trees heavily scored to bring out the latex sap still stand on old plantations but the trade is gone. Manaus is still booming, however, and its expanded population needs vast quantities of food. Fish is essentially the only major source of protein here. Fish taken from the Amazon in gigantic numbers and stacked at markets for sale.
Heavy fishing has so depleted the numbers of fish in the river that fishermen now have to travel eight days from Manaus to get to fishing grounds where they can fill their nets. Surprisingly, overfishing directly threatens the rainforest. Huge areas of Amazonia spend part of the year underwater as the river washes over the floodplains. Fish are one of the secrets of the forest diversity. Though the fish are major seed predators, they are also some of the best seed dispersers. Swimming between submerged tree trunks, fish like this piranha eat fallen fruits and then deposit the seeds over the flooded areas. When the water drains, the seeds take root, ensuring continual regrowth. With such a distribution system, while there may be hundreds of tree species in a square mile, the individuals of some may be hundreds of yards apart. At least that was the case in the past. Today, the seemingly impregnable rainforest faces what may be the worst threat ever. chainsaw. It gives a single man the power to fell the mightiest jungle patriarch. Estimates of how quickly the Amazon forest is being raised vary widely from 7 to almost 30 million acres a year. The forest is still there. It's simply no longer standing. Ironically, the wood of most of the trees has little commercial value today. These forests were simply in the way, standing on land that man wanted for agriculture. After drying in the equatorial sun, the wood is ready for the next assault. <laughs> Fire. Fires greedily consume the dried bones of the forest, whipping the air into whirlwinds and sending a pall of black smoke into the sky. Unlike most temperate forests, which build up banks of nutrients in the soil, 70% of the nutrients in the Amazon are locked up in its living matter. Its destruction by burning destroys this living storehouse of vital elements. If over a period of time the entire Amazon forest were burned, as many fear could eventually happen, trillions of tons of carbon would be injected into the atmosphere. There is concern among some scientists that releasing this much carbon into the air will add to the global warming of the greenhouse effect. Most certainly, the removal of the forest would cause increased erosion and flooding, and limit the ability of the Amazon basin to absorb and recycle most of its rainwater. Drying trends due to deforestation have already caused famines in Africa. Though many are alarmed at the loss of species and habitat when a forest is burned, Developing countries like Brazil look at land conversion as a way to compete in the global economy.
the balance between exploitation and conservation then becomes all important. One man taking action is Dr. Thomas Lovejoy of the World Wildlife Fund, an organization working closely with the concerned agencies of the Brazilian government to preserve threatened species and habitat. These charred remains of a rainforest are testimony to how fast it is disappearing all around the world. It is going at a rate of 25 to 50 acres a minute, about the size of the state of West Virginia every year. And with it goes countless species of animals and plants, wonderful works of nature that will never have been seen by anyone. The forest is destroyed to make way for cattle ranches. The government of Brazil permits only 50% of the forest in a given area to be destroyed and subsidizes most of the costs of cattle ranching operations on the cleared land. The soil of the rainforest is extremely thin and nutrient poor. Early research suggested that five years could exhaust the soil, but some of the cattle ranches have been in operation with very careful management for several years, with no ill effects apparent. The initial projections may have been premature. Other industries were tried but failed. Charcoal production seemed like a good bet, but lack of demand shut down the kilns. The lumber industry sputtered because of the great expense of shipping wood down the Amazon. Despite all the cutting going on now, Brazil still imports most of its timber products. The sawmills sit idle. Near Manaus, Brazil's National Research Institute for Amazonia has set up a number of field stations. Among its installations is a 150-foot tower, which juts above the canopy for scientific observation. Working with Brazilian scientist Herbert Schubart, Lovejoy found a way to take advantage of the situation in Amazonia by beginning a unique research project that will continue into the next century. While a lot of the forest is already gone, uh, there certainly is a lot of it left. If you can come up here on top of the forest, you can see that it really stretches in an almost unbroken line, hundreds of miles up to Venezuela, a thousand miles to the Andes. But we really can't count on this forest staying intact like this forever. Here is everywhere in the rainforest, the pressures are growing and relentless. So that is why we've started this minimum critical size of ecosystems project. And what we're trying to do is find out enough about this forest so we can really say how big is big enough for a national park to protect a sample of this wonderful formation forever. Dr. Lovejoy's project uses the ongoing destruction of habitat as an aid to studying the rainforest. Knowing that a development project in the Amazon must leave 50% of the forest standing, Lovejoy and his Brazilian colleagues persuaded the government and some ranchers to allow him to decide which 50% to cut and which 50% to leave as study areas shaped to his specifications. By isolating parcels of forest ranging in size from two and a half up through 25,000 acres, Lovejoy's team can now discover how big an area each species needs to survive. How big is big enough for a forest preserve?
Larger animals are comparatively easy to study, but the forest abounds with literally millions of other species, mostly very small, that are all important parts of this immense jigsaw puzzle. We need to understand how many different kinds of animals and plants respond to isolation. That means we need to understand their ecology and primeval, virtually untouched forest as compared to isolated fragments. So we assembled a team of Brazilians and Americans, scientists of many kinds, ornithologists, mammalogists, herpetologists, entomologists, to consider this problem in great detail. There's still so much to be discovered and so little is known about many species in the rainforest. Why do these caterpillars with their poisonous spines cluster on this tree? And what is this wasp searching for among them? Why do these caterpillars seem drawn to the cluster? The interdependence of jungle organisms shows up in surprising ways. Peccaries found the two and a half and 25 acre parcels of Lovejoy's project much too small and migrated out. The muddy wallows that they'd created then dried up. Three species of frogs who use those wallows for breeding suddenly found themselves in an inhospitable environment. They died out. Scientists hypothesize that for any one species eliminated, many others in the chain will die. That's only one example of the many interconnections that this project has brought to light. But the ways of the forest are still largely a mystery. This ecosystem is complicated beyond our ability to imagine and the study of its dynamics is in its infancy. Our understanding must be limited because the vast majority of species in the forest have yet to be discovered. Most of them are small and unobtrusive, but some announce their presence very clearly. Raucous calls of howler monkeys communicate effectively over long distances, helping to keep the groups evenly spaced. But although they're the largest primates in the Amazon, they've survived even in the small 25-acre parcels. Their home ranges are relatively small because of their peculiar tastes. Leaves, which make up half of their diet, are everywhere plentiful, so they have no need to travel far in search of food. To them, the forest is one big salad. As many as 25 howlers in groups of three to 10 individuals can live within a single square mile here. With a population density of as high as 150 per square mile, the squirrel monkey is the most common primate in Amazonia. Omnivorous, they prefer a high energy diet of insects and fleshy fruits. Since their food is widely scattered, the squirrel monkey requires a range 20 times as large as the howler, up to two square miles. Spider monkeys travel in small groups, but these groups are very loosely organized. The only truly stable associations are between females and their offspring. The spider monkey is one of the most agile of the New World monkeys. 
using its long limbs and prehensile tail to swing through the canopy, they can indeed look distinctly spider-like. A fruit eater like the squirrel monkey, spider monkeys require a large area as well, moving through at least 500 acres of the high canopy. Capuchin monkeys, familiar to us as organ grinder monkeys, are true omnivores and will eat almost anything. They travel wide distances in search of high energy foods such as nuts, fruits, and small vertebrates. The smaller parcels of forest were not large enough to fill the capuchin's needs, and they moved out. Wilson Spirinello, a Brazilian researcher with the Minimum Critical Size Project, has followed one troop of Capuchins for almost two years, observing and recording their behavior. It may seem somewhat paradoxical that a smaller monkey requires a larger range, but again, it's the Capuchin's varied diet, including wasps' nests and the succulent pith of green shoots that requires so much mobility. Probably the most difficult area of the rainforest to study is the high canopy. It's also where the majority of species live. Since man finds it difficult to get up there, he brings what's there down to the ground. One of the most common mammals is a species of possum, a tree-dwelling marsupial. By trapping and retrapping, researchers can ascertain what is living where in the canopy and how much territory it needs to thrive. If the same possum is trapped more than once or twice in an isolated reserve, that's an indication the animal is doing well in the limited area. After collecting data on the animal, it's released unharmed. In the reserve areas, some possums have been trapped on the forest floor. When normally arboreal species are caught on the ground, one can assume the treetops are overcrowded or changed so drastically that the animal was forced down. In one of the most ambitious parts of the project, research teams are attempting to catalog the incredible numbers of insect species in the rainforest. They trap them in specially designed tent-like snares. Flying toward the light, the insects are funneled into an alcohol bottle at the top, where they perish. Researchers set traps on all the isolated reserves and visit the traps on a daily basis, collecting samples of the myriad species in the forest.
The preserved bugs are decanted through a sieve and carried back to the lab for the tedious work of classification. The rainforest shows its true diversity in the millions of insect species that flourish there. And the researchers show their tenacity by patiently separating each and every one into general categories. A study of forest canopy beetles led a Smithsonian scientist to triple the number of species previously estimated to exist on Earth. At the World Wildlife Fund's Brazilian agency counterpart, the laboratory is bulging with samples that will take years to decipher. In one year alone, a quarter of a million insects were collected. Specimens are being sent out to laboratories in the United States and elsewhere for further study, and new species are being discovered all the time. Each of these specimens represents one more species that will not vanish before being studied, catalogued, and preserved, at least under glass. Scientists estimate we have identified at best only a tenth of the plant and animal species alive today. We are woefully ignorant of each species' importance within the rainforest as well as its potential for human benefit. In a world which obtains a quarter of its pharmaceuticals from the rainforest, this knowledge is invaluable. One of the most vital natural activities that takes place in the tropical rainforest is pollination. And yet, its complexity makes it extremely difficult to study. Bees, flies, butterflies, beetles, birds, and even bats pollinate in the Amazon forest. And to further complicate things, very often a species of pollinator is specific to a certain plant or tree. Marcos Garcia, a researcher with the project, whose specialty is bees, studies the complicated matrix of pollinators and plants. The first step is to get up where the action is. Once high in the tree, Garcia traps and examines bees in his net to get a general notion of the insect activity in the area. If a more thorough investigation of a particular species hive is necessary, a tree outside the study area is cut down. A section containing the hive is cut from the tree and carried back to the campsite for in-depth study. Splitting the log exposes the hive. 
Unlike the honeybee, these bees do not sting, nor is their hive as geometrically precise. The queen is instantly recognized by her engorged body. Garcia lifts out a cross section of the hive to be returned to the laboratory. Studying the pollen in the hive will reveal the type of plants these bees pollinate. <laughs> The rest of the hive is returned to the forest, where the workers will create a new queen. Trees in the rainforest flower at different times, keeping the pollinators busy year-round. Because a pollinating species may be specific to a certain plant, if the pollinator vanishes, very likely the plant will disappear as well. Pollination is only one step in reproduction. The resulting seeds must be dispersed. Those birds that swallow seeds whole become significant dispersers. Others, like the colorful macaw, more frequently crush and eat the seeds, thereby destroying them. Since birds are wide-ranging and involved in both pollination and seed dispersal, they help maintain the forest's diversity. To better understand the birds' vital role in the forest, they're studied very closely. Every three to four weeks in each reserve, mist nets are opened at dawn and then checked hourly. Ensnared birds are measured and banded, or if already banded, recorded. Dr. Rob Beergard, an ornithologist, served for several years as the project's first field director. Through his studies, he has found that in the two and a half acre parcels, almost half of the bird species disappeared within a year. Even in the 25 acre plot, one fifth of the indigenous bird species were no longer found, illustrating the dramatic and devastating effect that diminishing size and isolation can have on the rainforest. The reasons for the loss of species have been difficult to pinpoint, but one important vehicle for change has been identified. It's called the edge effect. Deforestation has created an edge to this forest where it never had one before. Without the surrounding vegetation, the forest is exposed to light and changes in temperature and humidity, indeed far-reaching changes which are alien to the forest interior. The most immediately apparent change at the edge is the tree's exposure to wind. The individual trees depend upon one another for support. Cutting an edge into a rainforest creates a sort of domino effect, where one casualty can easily lead to another. Rainforest trees have shallow root systems and are not designed to withstand such force. But the effects of an edge penetrate far beyond the actual edge itself. Wind and light streaming in from the cleared areas create a brighter, warmer, drier environment a hundred yards inside the reserve making a two and a half acre parcel all edge and no forest. Even a 250 acre area consists of 20% edge. Butterflies, because they and their habits are relatively well known, make a good barometer for reading the effects of nearby deforestation. This species prefers open fields where they can feed on the minerals and the bare earth, and where there's plenty of sunlight. 
The newly created edge is perfect for them. In the deep forest, past the effect of the edge, the butterfly population is completely different. Roger Hutchings, a Colombian national working with the project, traps and marks butterflies using a trap baited with fermented bananas. Butterflies and plants have often evolved together and have become almost totally interdependent, but their relationships are not yet completely understood. The electric blue morpho can be found only in the dark interior of the forest, where the blue upper surfaces and drab lower surfaces of its wings create flashing signals to attract a mate. The morpho requires a large area in order to thrive. Hutchings marks it harmlessly with a felt-tipped pen. Because of the edge effect, the diversity of butterflies has actually increased in the experimental reserves due to sun-loving field and canopy species moving into the now brighter forest. But the interior species have declined dramatically. The one exception is the pyrid butterfly. Though an interior species, its larvae eat rotting plants, which the edge cutting creates in abundance. Hutchings baits them with the pungent material which the males eat to acquire chemicals essential to create mating pheromones. Butterflies are known as indicator species. By determining numbers, species, and flight patterns of butterflies, not only do we increase our knowledge of the insects, but we can also gauge conditions in the forests. The edge also makes it easier for exotic, introduced species to invade the forest, including one unwelcome newcomer, the African killer bee. Killer bees, imported 20 years ago from Africa in an effort to increase honey production, accidentally escaped from a laboratory in Sao Paulo and have since spread out over all of South and Central America and have even made their way to the southern United States. Though the killer bees do not fare well in the jungle itself, the edges are perfect for them. The smoke stuns them so they can be collected for study. But the bees are normally easy to anger and savagely aggressive and have been responsible for several human deaths. More aggressive, the African bees may prevent highly evolved native species from pollinating plants. Since the savage newcomers are not evolved to replace those pollinators, they may seriously disrupt the natural ecosystem of the rainforest. In the forest's dark interior, leafcutter ants troop off to the canopy by the thousands. Guided by chemical trails laid down with their stings, they diligently bring uniform-sized chunks of leaf back to their underground nest. These tiny organisms consume more forest vegetation than any other group of animals, but they don't actually eat the leaves. Instead, they cut them into ever smaller pieces, creating a mulch for their underground gardens. There, like farmers, they raise a crop of nourishing fungus.
The edge reveals an interesting variation of this behavior. Another type of leafcutter ant, in addition to sending hordes of workers up a tree to bring back little chunks of leaf, sends up some larger workers with well-developed jaws. These lop off whole stems and twigs and let them drop to workers swarming at the tree's base. Though they cannot actually take aim, there are enough workers in a population of up to four million per nest to see to it that all the cuttings are gathered. The end result is the same, but this operation seems a quantum leap in efficiency. The division of labor among leafcutter ants is elaborate and is based on the difference in size. The largest worker ant is six times the size of the smallest. Sometimes their dedication to the job gets the best of them. But when you're as small as an ant, a fall from 100 feet becomes just a harmless shortcut to the nest. Something has drawn this swarm of termites out of the deep forest. A scouting worker has laid down a chemical trail to the new food sources found in the recently created clearings. Colonies of termites take advantage of the edge with its fallen trees and any other wood handy, including telephone poles and fence posts. At first, ranchers try to defend their fences, but it's a hopeless battle, and in the end, they're forced to give up. Termite nests are marvels of engineering, often built high up on a dead tree. Termites are nocturnal creatures, avoiding the heat of the day, waiting for the cool night, which brings them out of their secure, climate-controlled nest. At night, workers stream by the thousands into the interiors of dead trees to harvest the wood. The termite is one of the few animals capable of digesting wood. Microorganisms in their intestines ferment the hard fiber and release the nutrients. Termites play an essential role in the rapid transformation of dead organic matter into the living forest. When their work is done, the tree is an empty hulk and well on the way to being recycled. The termites help clean the fields of debris, making it easier for the cattle to graze. And the cattle, in turn, attract the forest's largest predator, a jaguar, looking for an unlucky calf.
The odds are against the ranchers. They stay in business only because of government subsidies. Rainforest soil is poor soil for any kind of agriculture, while snakes, jaguars, and poisonous plants take their toll. Vultures benefit from everyone's misfortune. In the meantime, nature tries to heal its wounds. Secondary growth, such as the fast-growing Cecropia tree, insistently springs forth in the newly opened clearings. Soon, dense new forests cover the former pastures. They simply become another sort of pasture for another sort of grazer the three-toed sloth. Sloths can make up two-thirds of the mammal biomass in a tropical forest. In one square mile, there may be 1,500 sloths. They eat only leaves and find Cecropia leaves much more palatable than those from the forest interior. Their digestive system, the slowest of any mammal, ferments the ingested leaves using microorganisms that are passed on from mother to offspring. With a seemingly endless supply of food, this is one creature that seems quite pleased with the turn of events. The cattle are not so lucky. They seem stuck between the primeval forest and an overgrown pasture. And the burning continues. The Indians of Amazonia used slash and burn techniques, but only in very small isolated plots. Modern, high-tech forest clearing raises doubts and fears in many. Brazil argues that it is their country's right to decide how to exploit its own resources. But the cost is great. If left alone, it may take 300 years for this forest to return. If the worldwide cutting of rainforests continues at the current rate, in 40 years, all rainforest will be gone. How much more will be cut and burned? What effect will this have on the survival of the rainforest and on our own survival? Will the day come when we cut down the last tree? Burning questions indeed, but there is room for hope. If the Brazilian government maintains its current dedication to saving 50% of the Amazon rainforest, and if research projects such as Dr. Lovejoy's continue, this forest and its inhabitants may well have a future. Life on Earth reaches its fullest expression in these great forests, and there still is time to safeguard a major portion. The job is far from complete, but in Brazil and elsewhere, there is a growing awareness of the importance of these great forests and of the threats to their existence. The more we learn about these forests and their secrets, the more we recognize their importance and the need to protect them for this and future generations. The rainforest is an ocean rich in biological treasures, and we have only begun to explore its depths. This program will be repeated Tuesday at 12 noon. Masterpiece Theater is next at 9. Stay with us for the best in television theater.